dumping syndrome. So your dumping syndrome occurs postprandial, meaning after meals, and it's characterized by the rapid emptying of gastric contents. So that's why it's referred to as dumping syndrome because it's as if you dump all the food that you have taken down to your intestines. So this usually happens if your patient had gastric surgery. So instead of the food slowly transiting from your stomach going towards your small intestine, it's as if the food jumped from your stomach to your small intestines. Okay, so it's characterized by rapid emptying of gastric contents. This is usually self-limiting, okay, self-limiting, which uh, lasts for 6 to 12 months. So what are the signs and symptoms? If a gastric fullness, then weakness, dizziness, vertigo, diaphoresis. Patient would have tachycardia, abdominal cramping, and then, again, as I mentioned, it's self-limiting. Now, what is our hmm, manifestation for this patient? Early manifestations will be 5 to 30 minutes after eating. That would involve vasomotor disturbances. So vasomotor disturbances are vertigo, tachycardia, syncope, sweating, patient would have pallor, palpitation, diarrhea, and then nausea. As you can notice, it's as if there's something big that went through the intestines of your patient. Okay, so the GI tract, the lower GI tract is irritated. Um, intestinal manifestations would include the one listed in your handouts. So you have epigastric, fullness, distension, dizziness, okay, cramping. Client may experience tenesmus. Try to find out what tenesmus is. The nausea, abdominal discomfort, lightheadedness, confusion, and palpitations. Whereas late manifestations, okay, which may occur two to three hours after uh, eating, would include hypoglycemia. So why? Why hypoglycemia? Okay, if you can recall, the food uh, rapidly passed through the stomach going towards the intestine. By the time that the food is in the intestine, the pancreas would be triggered to release a lot of insulin because the pancreas would think that there is a lot of food going in. But later on, when this food is already going down the GI tract, there is too much of insulin supply. Okay, hence, this too much insulin supply or excessive release of insulin okay, would, in fact, decrease the blood pressure of your patient. Okay, so that's why if you can see there are signs of hypoglycemia among your patients with dumping syndrome. Now, let's, let's come to think of it. The main problem in your dumping syndrome is that there is a rapid transition of the food from the stomach going towards the small intestine. So with that, try to think, shall I give fluids to my patient? If you will be giving fluids to your patient, the tendency is that you're increasing the rate that the food is being transferred okay, from the stomach to the small intestines. That's why fluids one hour before and during meals is contraindicated. Okay, fluids are preferably given two hours after meals. And this time, look at this. Among the few disorders wherein you prescribe high-protein, high-fat diet, high-fat and dry diet. Why? If you can recall our discussion, fat would slowly transit in the going towards the small intestine. In fact, the fat will be staying in the stomach. Okay, for that reason, in this case, we would want the food first to stay in the stomach. We want the food to be slower, slower when it comes to when it goes down to your small intestine. That's why we give your high fat diet. And then if manifestation persists, we reduce the size of the gastroenterostomy or there is a an attempt to convert your Bilroth 2 to your Bilroth 1. So this is how your gastroenterostomy would look like. So a creation of a passageway between the body of the stomach and then the jejunum. Okay, so this is the body of the stomach. There's a passageway going towards the jejunum. And then, uh, of course, your Bilroth 1 and your Bilroth 2. I hope that by this time, you're able to differentiate already Bilroth 1 and Bilroth before we proceed to our next topic, which will be about inflammatory bowel disorders, I would like you to ask yourselves first. Okay, let's talk about the disorders that we've discussed previously, such as your GERD, and then you have your gastrointestinal bleeding, gastritis, and then you also have your peptic ulcer disease. By this time, you should be able to differentiate already between acute gastritis and chronic gastritis. Okay, between the two gastritis, you should be able to know if what kind of gastritis increases the risk for pernicious anemia. Okay, that's one thing. Also, you need to know the difference between type A gastritis and type B gastritis. When it comes to your peptic ulcer disease, you should be able to know already 
if it is duodenal or gastric ulcer that would lead to weight loss or weight gain. You should also be able to know if vomiting can relieve the pain in gastric cancer and if vomiting can relieve the pain in duodenal ulcer. Okay, I was referring to ulcer, by the way, and not cancer. You also need to remember if when is Milena more likely and where, when is hematemesis more likely? Is it on the gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcer? Who among the two can be helped by your antacids? Is it the gastric ulcer or the duodenal ulcer? Who among the two would have hypersecretion of acid? Is it your gastric ulcer or your duodenal ulcer? And who among the two could be possibly occurring among your old adult patients? Is it the gastric ulcer or the duodenal ulcer? Reviewing these concepts will be able to help you as we progress along your diseases. And then, if my patient would have the conditions that we discussed, what can be taken by the client on the food and what needs to be avoided by the client in terms of food? Let's take, for example, GERD. What can be taken by my patient? What needs to be avoided by my patient? What medications can be taken by my patient? What are the medications that need to be avoided by my patient? If my patient with a peptic ulcer disease, what is the dietary recommendation? And whereas if my patient would have dumping syndrome, what would be the diet that you would recommend? If you can answer those questions, I think you're doing well on understanding our topics. But if you still cannot answer those questions, try to go back to your handouts. Because by this time, you should be able to differentiate already the topics that we have discussed. Okay. Let's say high-fat diet recommended for? should know that by now. Problem on distal esophagus. Is it achalasia or DES? Okay. If, again, you are unable to answer these questions quickly, try to go back to our topics. I will be proceeding on inflammatory bowel disorders on the next discussion. Thank you very much for your kind attention.